The main thread that runs through this story is injustice. This story is about one woman's journey to help others and how it cost her everything. This story combines all of the horrors of what it has meant to be black in America, to be treated differently because of your race, and to be hunted because of your race, to have the law weaponized against you just because you're black, and for justice and fairness to be out of reach for you because you're black. This is the story of Viola Edwards. Before I get into her story, I wanna give you some historical context first. This is important to fully understand this case that I'm gonna talk about in this video. So give me a few moments while I break this down for you. When you think of the modern civil rights movement, NAACP figures like Thurgood Marshall come to mind and how Marshall and a group of dedicated black lawyers mounted a years long campaign in the courts to desegregate American schools. Every year, we celebrate the 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education Supreme Court decision that ended segregation in public schools in America. But what is less talked about is the NAACP's battle against rendition and returning black fugitives to the South to face Jim Crow justice. I've talked about this process of rendition before in another video entitled Wilbur Smith, and I'm not gonna repeat myself here and go into it fully, so check that video out. But what I do want to do is give you some background about it to understand Viola's case. In the early 20th century, there started to be a shift towards legal lynchings. Quick and unjust racially biased trials replaced mob violence with unjust prosecutions and state sanctioned executions. Black people did not stand a chance to get a fair trial in Southern courts, and even if they did, they risked being lynched. So many black people fled prosecution rather than being a victim of Jim Crow justice. But just like during slavery times, Southern states sought the return of black fugitives from Northern states back to the South through a legal process called rendition. The NAACP made stopping the extradition of black people back to the Jim Crow South a centerpiece of its agenda in the 1920s and 1930s, as it sought to stop the racial terror that black people were experiencing all across the South. Between 1918 and 1940, the NAACP took on 40 rendition cases to stop black people from being sent back to the Jim Crow South. The NAACP was successful in at least 18 of those cases. The extradition clause of the Constitution requires that states comply and assist in extraditing a fugitive. However, there was a wrinkle in the law. In an 1861 case called Kentucky versus Denison, the United States Supreme Court said that although states had a moral duty to return fugitives, the federal government had no authority to compel another state governor to return a fugitive or to really do anything at all. NAACP lawyers used this wrinkle to petition governors when black people had escaped to stop their extradition back to that particular southern state. If the petition failed, they would then take the case to court to try to stop the extradition. In hearings before Northern governors, NAACP lawyers would present evidence that would prove that the person was not guilty of the crime that they were accused of. They would also provide evidence that would prove that the black person would be harmed and would also be possibly lynched if they were to be returned to the Southern state. They present the statistics on the number of lynchings from that particular state. NAACP Secretary Walter White, he was the leading authority on lynchings and mob violence in America at that time. He had written the organization's report that was entitled 30 years of lynching in the United States. That brings me to what happened to Viola Edwards in Florida in 1927. Viola Edwards was born Viola Washington in 1874 in Watumka, Alabama to Charles and Betty Washington. Viola was the daughter of formerly enslaved black people. She was one of two children. Growing up, Viola learned to read and to write. Before moving to Florida, she worked as a private cook. Viola also trained as a nurse. She attended the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. Booker T. Washington and the Tuskegee Institute had one of the first training programs for black nurses in the United States. It was led by Dr. J.A. Kinney, who was the medical director and chief surgeon at the hospital on Tuskegee's campus. Tuskegee trained black nurses and sent them out all across the country to serve black people who were being denied access to medical care. Viola would have been in one of the first graduating classes at Tuskegee. Viola met Willie Edwards. He was from Pensacola and from a prominent family. His first wife, Elodie, had died in 1906, leaving Willie a widow to care for their three young children. Willie was one of six black people that worked for the U.S. Postal Service, delivering mail by railroad from Watumka. In January of 1908, 34-year-old Viola married Willie and moved to his home in Pensacola. Viola and Willie lived in a grand home. They lived in a spacious home in Pensacola's black Belmont de Villiers district. It was like a black Wall Street that you would see in other cities where black people had settled after emancipation and after slavery ended. It was similar to the black prosperous communities like 
the Georgetown section of Sanford, Florida, and the village of Rosewood, Florida, and Okoye, Florida. These were all cities and areas where black people could feel safe from the confines of the Jim Crow South. Once in Pensacola and married, Viola continued to elevate herself. She wanted to advance her nursing career, so she went to New York City in 1920 and got more training at the Bellevue Hospital. And in 1924, Viola founded the first maternity hospital for black women in Pensacola. It was right next to the home she shared with Willie and her stepchildren on DeVillia Street. She called it the Viola Edwards Hospital. This hospital was the talk of the town. Viola had hired an all black staff to work in the hospital. Viola's hospital was providing a service that was desperately needed in black communities. You see, Jim Crow affected every area of black life, including access to medical care. I don't wanna to get too deep into this area, but I do wanna talk a little bit about the historical injustice in healthcare to give you some perspective on just how groundbreaking Viola Edwards Hospital was. After slavery, black people were denied access to any healthcare. During slavery, slave owners provided some medical assistance to the enslaved black people on their plantation. But after emancipation, many former slave owners felt that it was a responsibility of the federal government to take care of the health of the newly freed black people because their position was the federal government had freed these black people. In Virginia, white planters refused to provide medical treatment to newly freed black people. And when they became infected with smallpox, they sent the infected black people to Washington, D.C. It wasn't until June of 1865, when General Oliver Howard created the medical division of the Freedmen's Bureau, that newly freed black people finally started to receive healthcare and medical attention. As the country moved into the 20th century, Jim Crow and racial segregation joined forces with the healthcare system to inflict even more damage on black people. Healthcare also had to be separated by race. State legislatures passed laws to ensure that black people did not get adequate healthcare. Alabama had a law that prohibited white nurses from even entering a room with black male patients. Mississippi, they had a law that required separate entrances for black patients and visitors. These laws created a system that ensured that black people would receive inferior health care. Because of this, black doctors and black nurses like Viola Edwards had to start their own medical facilities to care for black people and black patients. Viola's hospital was desperately needed in Pensacola, but that wasn't all that she did. She also took the skills that she learned as a private cook in Alabama and started her own restaurant. Her restaurant and hospital were vital parts of the growing black commercial district in Pensacola. But despite her success, she could not escape the consequences of being in the same room and vicinity as Jim Crow. The nightmare that would be the rest of Viola's life all started because of the actions of a white man. In 1927, 32-year-old Eugene Tart was a prominent businessman and he was having an affair with his 27-year-old white secretary named Dorothy Friedrichson. Tart had been married for 10 years at this point. What he was doing with Dorothy wasn't just a problem for the obvious reasons of him being a married man. It was also a problem because Dorothy was a daughter of a very well-known businessman named Charles Fridrickson in Pensacola, who had recently passed away. And the Tarts and the Fridrickson families knew each other very well. This situation turned from bad to even worse when Dorothy became pregnant. Eugene Tart wanted this all to go away quietly without anyone knowing what he had done. In August of 1927, Eugene brought Dorothy to Viola's hospital to get an abortion. Eugene and Dorothy used a fake name when they came to the hospital. They told Viola that her name was Miss Barnes and she was a tourist traveling to Miami. Both Eugene and Dorothy agreed to go forward with the procedure. Dorothy became ill and died a few days later. A coroner's inquest was held days after Dorothy died to determine if criminal charges will be filed. In all, 11 witnesses testified before the jury during two days of testimony. After hearing from the witnesses, the jury brought charges against Viola Edwards, Eugene Tarp, and two black doctors, E.C. Moon and S. McGee, who attended to Dorothy and a black female nurse named Florida Anderson. They were all charged with Dorothy's death. Eugene Tart was able to bond out immediately. The two black doctors bonded out two days later. Viola and Florida remained in jail because they were unable to pay the $5,000 bond. After being arrested and indicted, Viola hired attorney J. Montrose Adrihi to represent her. He was a local attorney and former U.S. commissioner. Viola and the others pled not guilty. The trial started six weeks later on September 22, 1927. Judge C. Moreno Jones presided. A jury of six white men were chosen for the case. The prosecution called a dozen witnesses in the quest to convict Viola and the others. It was revealed during the trial that during the five days between the procedure and Dorothy dying, Viola had called several doctors to her hospital to treat Dorothy. One white doctor flat out refused because he said that something criminal had happened at Viola's hospital. 
Eugene Tart was present and he begged the doctor to treat Dorothy, but the white doctor said no. The defendants put forth a theory that Dorothy had heart trouble and that caused her death. The prosecution made race a central feature of his case by making Viola Edwards Hospital out to be something that it was not. Prosecutors tried to paint the picture that Viola was a Negro and her Negro hospital was bad and causing harm to the people. In his closing argument, the prosecutor said that God had intervened to expose Viola and her Negro hospital. Viola's attorney said that the prosecution's case was laughable and made of nothing but circumstantial evidence. He said that Viola's hospital was not just a Negro hospital. He told the jury that white people had also been treated at her hospital. The jury of six men deliberated for 90 minutes. At 8.13 p.m. on Friday, September 23rd, 1927, jury foreman Frank Griffin read the verdict to the packed courtroom. Viola, Tart, and the other defendants were found not guilty on all charges. When the verdict was read, there was excitement in the courtroom. White people actually clapped. Black people in the courtroom leaned across the rails to congratulate Viola and shake her hand. But that wasn't the end. The prosecution and the white community were determined to make Viola Edwards pay for what they believed she had done. The white community in Pensacola still was very much upset by what happened and the not guilty verdict only enraged them more. In the weeks that followed, in white churches all across Pensacola, pulpits were used to attack the jury's not guilty verdict. And much of the anger was directed at Viola and her Negro hospital. The prosecutor brought a second case, this time for the death of the fetus. On October 21st, 1927, Eugene Tart and Viola Edwards were charged again. Around the same time that the second case was brought, Viola's hospital and her home were set on fire. Everything that Viola had worked for was literally up in flames. Viola Edwards was found not guilty by a jury of white men. That should have been the end of this case. The courts heard the case and decided that the state could not meet its burden and prove her guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But the new indictment had meant that some would not be satisfied until she was convicted and sent to prison or worse, lynched. Viola knew that she would never get another fair trial in Florida, so she decided to leave. She took a few items with her and at age 53, she said goodbye to her stepchildren and to her husband and left everything that she had built behind. She first went back to her hometown of Watumka, Alabama and made sure that her mother was safe and with relatives. She then traveled up to Detroit. She hoped things would have calmed down in Pensacola when she was away. Before I get into the next part of what happened to Viola, I wanna tell you why Viola fled to Detroit. It was not just a random place that she sought to go to. It was a strategic city. Black people had long flocked to Michigan to escape Jim Crow bondage. It actually goes back to before emancipation. Before the Civil War, thousands of runaway enslaved black people crossed the Detroit River and into Canada every single year. Between 1842 and 1862, over 30,000 black people made the journey. When the Michigan Territory abolished slavery in 1835, black people settled there and began to create a community that was dedicated to resisting black bondage. In fact, one of the nation's first race riots occurred there in 1833 to keep a Southern state from capturing two runaway enslaved black people and sending them back to the South. It was this history of fighting oppression that created a strong black population in Detroit that was prepared to fight Jim Crow. As black people fled racial terror in the South during the Great Migration, they made their way to bigger Northern cities like Detroit and black Detroit continued to resist Jim Crow efforts to capture and return black people to the bondage and lynchings of the South. In fact, Detroit's chapter of the NAACP was the largest in the nation. So when black refugees made their way from the South to Detroit, the black population was well equipped to protect them from the Southern state's attempt to extend the borders of Jim Crow justice. And that is why Viola Edwards fled from Florida to Detroit after she was wrongfully prosecuted. Once in Detroit, Viola settled in Detroit's Black Bottom neighborhood. She moved in with a black family named the Bostons. William and Clara Boston allowed Viola to stay in their home. She worked as an assembler for Donegan Electric Manufacturing Company. Viola also connected with Dr. Alf Thomas. He was a prominent black doctor in Detroit. He owned and operated several black hospitals there. Viola worked as a nurse in his hospitals. She had worked with Dr. Thomas's brother, who was a podiatrist in Pensacola. During this time, Viola Edwards became one of the most wanted people in America. Pensacola officials offered a reward for information leading to her capture. They became even more angry and determined to get her when it was revealed that over a dozen white women had obtained abortions at Viola's hospital. While Viola was running for her life, Eugene Tart was living his as if nothing had happened. He faced no consequences for his actions. 
The white community blamed the secretary for her own death because she was unmarried and they called her an abortionist. But officials didn't just want Viola in jail. They also wanted to bankrupt her and take everything that she and Willie had ever worked for. In April of 1927, her hospital was foreclosed on and sold at public auction. All of her hard work was suddenly being wiped away as if it had never happened. For a while, Viola had thought that maybe this was all over and she could move on with her life. She was wrong. The life that she had built for herself all came crashing down one night in October of 1928. A friend of Viola's told her that the police were looking for her and wanted to speak to Viola. Viola knew exactly what the police wanted and she decided to hide. She stayed in her room at the Boston's house, but the police were not deterred by this. Detroit's chief detective Edward Fox knew who Viola was and was determined to arrest her. And he was no stranger to taking down criminals. He prided himself on this. He had been honored a dozen times before for bravery long before his hunt for Viola Edwards ever started. There was a $100 reward for information on Viola's whereabouts and Detective Fox was determined to find, arrest, and get the reward for Viola. When Pensacola Police Chief William O'Connell received word that Fox had found Viola, he told Fox to hold Viola at any cost. You see, Fox did not yet have a warrant for Viola's arrest. Chief O'Connell told Fox that he'd be responsible for what happened and get a warrant. But Fox was not to let Viola out of jail. And that's exactly what happened. Fox arrested Viola and O'Connell secured a warrant for Viola's arrest. Chief O'Connell sent Escambia Sheriff Mose Penton to Detroit to bring Viola back to Florida. At this point, it should have been a quick extradition proceeding, but it wasn't. A fight to take Viola back to Florida and one to keep her in Detroit began. After Viola was arrested in Detroit, her friends contacted black attorney W. Hayes McKinney. He was the president of the Detroit NAACP branch. He had experience in the area of fighting attempts of Southern states trying to drag black people back into his clutches of injustice to face Jim Crow and mob justice. In 1920, he waged a two-year battle to keep a black man named Tom Ray from being sent back to Georgia. Ray had taken the life of his white employer after they got into an argument over unpaid wages. Attorney McKinney and the NAACP were able to convince the governor of Michigan to deny Georgia's extradition request by presenting evidence of Georgia's lynching record to show that if Tom Ray were to be sent back, there would be a good chance that he would be lynched. Attorney McKinney was prepared to do the same thing for Viola Edwards. Viola was released on a $10,000 bond after being arrested. Her bond was paid by two national bonding companies. Pensacola officials were upset about this and tried to find out who exactly paid her bond. They wanted Viola to remain in jail. Attorney McKinney worked with the NAACP national office to compile data about Florida's lynching record, and it was horrific. Floridians had lynched 195 people between 1889 and 1918. Black people lobbied Michigan Governor Fred Green and urged him not to return Viola. Governor Green said that he would not send Viola back to Florida until he was convinced that she would not become a victim of mob violence. Florida officials took issue with the fact that Viola's attorney, W. Hayes McKinney, argued that returning Viola to Florida would be handing her over for lynching. Sheriff Penton and others vigorously denied this and said that Viola would not be harmed and she'd be protected. Local officials and the mayor and commissioners and the U.S. attorney and U.S. marshal all sent telegrams to Michigan and said that Viola would not be harmed. U.S. Senator Duncan Fletcher, he personally sent Governor Green a telegram and provided his personal assurances for Viola's safety. Senator Fletcher said that Viola and her attorney, W. Hayes McKinney, were making Florida out to be bad people with unfounded accusations against Floridians. This was an interesting thing to say considering that by 1920, Florida had the nation's highest rate of lynching relative to its population. And papers in Pensacola regularly talked about black people being lynched in other states in the South. So it wasn't like this was a foreign practice that they had never heard of. It was practiced and celebrated in Florida. Viola had good reason to fear being lynched from the Pensacola jail. In 1908, the same year she married Willie, a black man named Leander Shaw was arrested for attacking and taking the life of a white woman. He was taken from the jail in Pensacola by a mob of thousands and hung from a lamppost. The mob fired at and injured three white sheriff's deputies. No one was ever held accountable for what happened. So Viola had good reason to believe that if she were to be returned to Florida, that she would face a similar fate. In August of 1928, Governor Fred Green refused to extradite Viola back to Florida. The governor said that the new charges against Viola in Florida were the same ones that she had already been acquitted of and that did not warrant sending Viola back to Florida for prosecution. Viola thought that this was all over and she was free to live her life. Once again, she was wrong. A few months later, 
Vala was arrested again in Detroit, this time by the federal government, on a completely unrelated charge. There were strong forces present in Florida that wanted to get Viola at all costs. After the state of Florida failed to bring her back, the federal government stepped in and used its power to capture and imprison Viola. Federal prosecutors claimed that in February of 1927, Viola was the guardian of a 16-year-old black boy named George Hearn and that she took money that was allocated to him for war risk insurance. It was clearly a trumped up case that was designed to make sure that Viola went to prison for something. Viola was arrested by the federal government and brought back to Florida to stand trial. Viola was represented again by her same attorney, attorney J. Montrose Adrihi. He challenged the embezzlement indictment and tried to have it thrown out, but the judge denied that request. In November of 1929, Viola was convicted of stealing $1,200 in insurance funds. She was sentenced to 18 months in federal prison. After serving her time in federal prison, life did not go back to normal for Viola. We don't know exactly what happened, but records indicate that Viola and Willie separated. It also looks like they lost the little wealth and security that they accumulated. The 1930 census records show that Willie still worked for the post office, but he no longer lived in that spacious home he once owned. He was renting a room in someone else's house. Viola was never able to resume her nursing career. Everything that Viola had worked for was gone. She lost everything. She eventually made her way back to Detroit and lived with the Boston family. Viola died at age 69 in 1943 in Detroit. As for Eugene Tarp, he was never prosecuted and went on with his life. All the charges were dismissed against him in January of 1929. Tarp died at age 46 in 1942 with his name and reputation intact. Jim Crow was absolutely relentless in his hunt for Viola Edwards. She worked so hard to get to where she was and it all came crashing down suddenly. And the law was used and twisted and manipulated until Jim Crow got the result that it wanted. I wanna know your thoughts on this video. Had you ever heard the story of Viola Edwards and how did it make you feel learning all that she went through? Leave me a comment down below and let me know your thoughts.